When it comes to the NFL, injuries are part of the game and they are a way of life as far as how teams perform against each other. As the Lions and Packers get set to do battle on Thursday night, both are coming in with massive injuries, but which one is going to have more impact on their chance to win? We're going to talk about it in today's episode, folks, so stay tuned. It started with an owner who had a last name fans despised, hiring a coach that the experts thought was crazy. But I got a plan, I swear to you. Who traded for a QB that was said to be washed up. They said the Detroit Lions would never amount to anything, that it would always be the same old Lions. But this team, our team, has a new identity, defined and expressed by the crazy head coach. Doesn't matter if you have one ass cheek and three toes, I will beat your ass. Led by the QB that nobody thought was good. Motor City Mania is in full swing and ready to start. So join the show and be prepared for kneecap biting because Motor City Mania starts right now. Hello everyone and welcome back to yet another episode of MCM Motor City Mania. I'm your host David T. Pike and we are diving in right now. So as always, I just want to say welcome back y'all. Thank y'all for your view. Thank y'all for your patience. Thank y'all for your support. I highly encourage y'all, please, if you've not done so already and you keep coming back, make sure you subscribe. And I just want to keep saying God bless. Thank you all for what you guys do. And let's dive into today's content. So here's the thing, folks. The Lions are getting set to play their second primetime game already of the season. We've only played, when we play on Thursday night, four games. So half of our season already has been on primetime. And so the Lions are getting set with this short week to get ready to play the Green Bay Packers in Green Bay for a primetime game on Thursday night football. However, though, there's a major question that looms over the Lions and, well, realistically over the Packers too. And the problem is, is that now, the, the Lions and the Packers have major players that you have to wonder if they're going to play. Because, again, we're talking about some injuries here that could impact the game one way or the other as far as how the teams will be able to perform, what team will be able to get the win, so on and so forth. And, I mean, let's understand something here. This is not your normal primetime game. I mean, let's, let's, let's be fair and honest. Primetime games in and of themselves have added, like, you know, kind of like uh, added worth, added heft to them as far as importance. But this is not just a primetime game. It's a primetime division rivalry game. This is, in essence, a rematch of what the freaking NFL did at the very end of last year when the Lions were put on primetime. I believe it was for Sunday Night Football. And they went into Green Bay, shut down the Green Bay Packers' ability to go to the playoffs. So this is a big game. This is a division. This is not only a division rivalry game. It's not only a freaking primetime game. It's also a game to determine who has the lead in the NFC North division. Because right now, technically, the lead is tied between both the Lions and the Packers with a 2-1 and one record. If you start getting into a little bit more nonsense past that, it gets a little bit more awkward. But realistically, it's a tie. This is the game that's going to determine who walks away with the bragging rights to say, yeah, we lead the division right now. We have the best record in the division. So, it's a big game. It's a huge game. So, Let's kind of talk about these injuries. Let's kind of talk about how they may or may not impact things for either the Lions or the Packers. So, to be clear, when you take a look at the Detroit Lions right now, there are at least a couple of names that are of supreme importance to the Lions' ability to win this upcoming game. The four biggest ones that we have, left tackle, Taylor Decker, running back, David Montgomery, cornerback, uh, Mosley, Emmanuel Mosley, and then the last one is safety, Kirby Joseph. Those right there, those four guys are of huge importance to the Lions that hopefully we can get to play in the game Thursday. Now, here's the thing. Of those four guys that I just mentioned, in my honest opinion, in my most educated guess, in what I could give as my best, you know, whatever, I'm thinking that three of those four have got a good shot of playing against the Packers on Thursday night football. And those three are Taylor Decker... Kirby Joseph, and David Montgomery. Those are the guys that I think that have the best shot out of those four that I think will most likely get on there. And of those three, the best ones that I have the best feeling about are probably Montgomery and Decker. And here's the reason why. 
first and foremost, let's kind of take a look at a little. Let's take a look at the kind of information that we've already got coming in here. First and foremost, we already know that Decker and Kirby have re have been rehabbing, and same thing with David Montgomery. But realistically, the biggest news for the Lions right now, and we're probably going to get another practice report that's going to come out later today, is that yesterday, and probably again today, the freaking three guys that I'm talking about here, they all were limited participants. And Mosley was also, was also uh, listed as a limited participant. Now granted, that's based off of an estimate because the Lions didn't actually practice yesterday. It was based off of if they had a practice, would those guys have been able to practice? And all of them were listed as limited participants. So that right there is good news. But let's understand something as we get a little bit more specific here. Let's take a look at first David Montgomery. Montgomery last week, before we played the game against the Atlanta Falcons, he was given a doubtful designation to play the game against the Falcons. Now, what does that mean? Well, here's the thing. There are three designations when it comes to injury concerns. You have doubtful, you have questionable, and you have probable. Pretty much what that means is this. Out, that's a 0% chance. They're not going to play. Doubtful, 25% chance. Questionable, 50% chance. Probable, 75% chance. And obviously, if you're in, 100% chance that player is going to play. That's how they do the designations. So pretty much what I'm saying is, last week, the Lions pretty much only had a 25% chance in their mind that David Montgomery was going to be able to play against the Falcons. Now, if you pretty much have watched football any given period of time, if a player is listed as questionable, even though it's a 50% designation, it more likely than not means that player is going to try and play. If it's a doubtful, more than likely than not, that means that the player is not going to play. But here's what I'm saying. If last week David Montgomery was listed as doubtful and already, according to the Lions estimate, he was listed as a limited participant, I'd be willing to bet that since one... David Montgomery has been in the division before because, remember, he used to be a part of the Bears. Now he's with the Lions. It's a division game. It's a big game. It's an important game. I guarantee you Montgomery's probably going to make a go of it. So that's something that is very, very crucial in my opinion. It's very, it, <coughs> excuse me, the fact that he would have practiced, the fact that he was listed as a doubtful indicator last week, I think is a good, is a good indication of the fact that we should most likely expect that Montgomery could go on Thursday night. So that's one. Now let's talk about Taylor Decker here. Taylor Decker actually had a, um, what was it, a press conference of not that long ago where they actually asked him the question about, is he going to play Thursday night? Is he going to actually play? Decker's response was a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but the basic response was, yes, he is going to try and play Thursday night. His mindset, his plan is to play Thursday night. Pretty much what Decker said was, listen, the only thing that's going to stop him from playing is if somebody higher up stops him, whether it's the team doctors or if it's Dan Campbell. But otherwise, in Decker's eyes, he has made the plan that he is going to play Thursday night. And if that's the way he feels, chances are he's going to play very likely. So that is especially good news for the Lions because what it means is you now have Decker holding down the blind side for Goff, and you can move Panay Sewell back to the right, and now your offensive line is almost back to full strength, which is going to be extremely crucial against this Packers defense because they do have some guys that can bring heat. They do have some guys that can bring pressure. But again, it's good to see that Decker's most likely going to play because for the last three weeks, he's been resting his foot. He's been getting it back up and strong again. So it's good to see that he's actually been in a position to be able to play. When I say three weeks, I'm talking about actual days. I know he played in the first game of the year, but if you think about it, that was a Thursday night game too. This is a Thursday night game that's coming up. That's 21 days. That's three weeks of actual time to rest that foot. Now, the last guy that I think there actually might be a shot to play is Kirby Joseph. Now, to be fair, Kirby Joseph did finish the game against the Seattle Seahawks a week ago, but he obviously missed the game against the Falcons. Again, the fact that he has that limited participant status in terms of la uh, in terms of yesterday's practice, again, is a good point. But again, because he missed the game last week and pretty much they ruled him out prematurely before the game even got, you know, there, his status is a little bit more up in the air. He hasn't had as much time to recover as Decker has. And on top of that, he didn't have a designation of doubtful or higher like Monty had last week. So I still expect and believe that Kirby could play, but he's a little bit more of an iffy one in my opinion. But I would like to think that he is definitely going to try. 
Now, as far as Mosley is concerned, again, the Lions definitely want to get him back, but they've been trying to eke him along very slowly. I would like to think they're going to bring him back this game, but I simply don't know. We're just going to have to wait and see on Mosley. Now, to be fair, like I started in this episode today, injuries should never be used as an excuse as to why a team can lose or not in terms of a game in the NFL because every team has the same mindset when it comes to injuries. It's next man up. And the Lions literally just won a game against the Falcons last week where they were missing all of these players that I just mentioned plus some other ones that aren't going to be back for quite a while such as C.J. Gardner-Johnson, such as Big V. And they lost even more in the game against the Falcons in terms of Matt Nelson and, and Skipper. So it's not like, you know, that the Lions don't have the idea of being able to play through games and win games with the injuries. So I'm not saying, as, as what my title is asking, I don't think the injuries are going to impact the Lions that much. And especially with the fact that I think a lot of these guys that were not playing last week are going to come back. And now, to be 100% fair, as I said in the beginning of the episode, the, the Green Bay Packers, they are also dealing with their own fair share of injuries. But here's the difference, though. The Packers' injuries are much more severe. They're much more um, debilitating, if you will, as far as for them to get their players back. And here's what I mean by this. I mentioned four guys early for the Lions that we're kind of waiting on to see what's going to happen. Wait and see mindset. And that was Decker, Kirby Joseph, Mosley, and David Montgomery. When it gets to the Packers, it's much more substantial. First and foremost, you have David Bakhtiari, a five-time All-Pro right uh, left tackle. Pardon me for the Packers. Here's the problem. Bakhtiari, at this point in his career, he is a day-to-day, week-to-week kind of designation. The Packers simply don't know if he's going to be available because his knee keeps flaring up. And at this point, I don't know how much longer Bakhtiari is going to be able to play if he continues to have the knee problems that he's having. But again... Bakhtiari is considered a day-to-day, week-to-week kind of designation because of that knee problem. And it doesn't look like he's going to be able to suit up this week either, at least from what I've been hearing from the Green Bay Packers practice reports, injury reports. <coughs> Excuse me. Then you move to the next guy on the list, which is which is Christian Watson, the wide receiver that a lot of Lions fans were high on last year. Again, so far, Watson hasn't really done a whole lot because he's still nursing a hamstring injury. And again, wasn't a part of the practice yesterday for the Packers. Hasn't really done a whole lot. I don't see him coming back either, especially with only two days to go. And this day's pretty much already half over. So I don't think Watson's going to play in today's in, in Thursday night's game. And then you have the Packers' best cornerback, which is Jair Alexander. Injured his back Wednesday last week. And if there's one thing us Lions fans know, especially with the whole situation with Levi Onzerike, back injuries are really, really tricky. They are really hard to get a handle on to figure out. So it's like, listen... Again, Jair Alexander was not a participant in yesterday's practice. If he does practice some point this week, it's probably going to be only limited, maybe one or two days. At best, he might be a questionable to play. But again, I don't see Alexander playing either. Then it just gets worse and worse because then you have two other offensive linemen outside of Bakhtiari for the Packers that are having issues. And that's Eldon Jenkins and Zach Tom. They're starting left guard and they're starting right tackle. Jenkins is a two-time pro bowler as a guard and he's dealing with an MCL injury with his knee. And then if you take a look at Zach Tom, he's also dealing with an injury to his knee. All three of those linemen that I just brought up, Jenkins, Tom, and Bakhtiari, they all might miss the game, which... I'm going to get to that a little bit later, but you Lions fans that are watching this, you already know where I'm going with this in my mind. And the final big injury of a player that didn't practice yesterday was Devondre Campbell, the the Packers linebacker. He's dealing with a knee-slash-ankle kind of injury. The point of the matter is is that all those guys did not practice yesterday. I don't really see most of them practicing today either. The only big-time player that the Packers kind of got back that has got a really decent shot of making this game is their running back, Aaron Jones, who was lim- who was a listed limited participant in Monday's practice for the Packers. Again, I that's about it. When you got all those other injuries, it's kind of hard to see how you're going to be able to piece a team together that's going to be able to compete on Thursday night football primetime. But again, if there's one thing I learned from the Seahawks game, do not underestimate any opponent just because they're injured. The Packers, it's a rivalry game. I fully expect they're going to bring us their best shot regardless of who's in or out. But again, it is interesting information to note all the same. Now, getting back to what I was trying to say here earlier, let's kind of go and let's take a look at this from another side of it. As I just stated, we're not going to underestimate the Packers. They're our division rival. They're going to bring their best shot. But 
The problem for the Packers is because of all the injuries that they currently have right now, most of which I don't see playing Thursday night. There are definite weaknesses that the Lions can definitely take advantage of in terms of the Packers. The first one is the Lions passing game versus the Packers defensive backs. Here's what I'm going to say right now. I have nothing but the maddest respect for freaking how good Jair Alexander is for the Packers. He is one of, if not the best cornerback in the NFL right now. But the problem is that with him not likely suiting up, like last week against the freaking Saints on Sunday... It's kind of plainly obvious that the Packers' pass defense takes a major blow. And I'm going to show you exactly what I mean here. If you go back to the Saints game that the the Packers played against, and they were at, they were, um, if I recall correctly, they were at home. Yeah, they were at home. If you go back to that game, freaking Derek Carr was the quarterback of the Saints in that game. He had 13 completions of 18 attempts for 103 yards, which was 72%, by the way. One touchdown, no interception, 104.6 pass rating with a 67.2 QBR rating or ranking, whatever. Here's the thing. By the time that we got to the point where Derek Carr got injured, we're looking at a 17-0 lead in terms of the Packers. Here's what I can say right now. If Carr doesn't get injured, chances are the Packers don't win that game. Because here's the difference of what happened after Carr went out. After Carr sustained that shoulder injury where he sprained his AC joint, which let me tell you something, I actually did that once when I was playing football too. That is not a fun injury to have, especially as a quarterback. But what happened is... Derek Carr goes out with that sprained AC joint, and then in comes Jameis Winston. Now take a look at the difference in terms of what Derek Carr did versus what Jameis Winston did. Jameis Winston comes in, he throws 10 of 16, which is 62.5%, so you're talking about 10% less in terms of completion percentage, throws about the same amount of yardages, yardages, huh, yardage, has no touchdowns, no interceptions, thank God, but his pass rating goes from 104.6 with Carr to 80.5 with Winston and a 67.2 QBR to a 55. So pretty much what happens is Carr's efficiency was keeping the Saints' offense in the game, and when Winston came in, he couldn't keep up that same efficiency, which allowed the Packers' offense to start slowly clawing their way back into the game, which is why the Packers eventually won that game by 1.18-17. to Now, when you put that in perspective, take a look at what Jared Goff is doing right now in the NFL. Jared Goff is a top-10 virtually almost top five quarterback in terms of the statistics. He's completed 72 of 103 passes, which is for 69.9 completion percent, which is sixth best in the NFL. He has 819 passing yards, sixth best in the NFL. Five passing touchdowns, tied for seventh. Two interceptions, a 101.6 passer rating, which is ranked fifth in the NFL, and a 70.8 QBR rating, which is for fourth best in the NFL. Let's just think about this realistically, folks. Take a look at the quarterbacks that the Packers have had to play against over their last couple of weeks. They played against Desmond Ritter. They just played against Derek Carr, who, as I said, the first half when Derek Carr was in before injury, before he got his shoulder injured, he was playing really damn well. And then, okay, Carr, Ritter, and who was the other guy? Oh, that's right, Justin Bustin Fields. So, realistically, the freaking Packers have not gone up against a quarterback of Goss caliber. And they have not gone up against an offense of the Lions caliber. So that right there is already kind of like a very interesting predicament for me because it's like, okay, you're most likely going to get Decker back. You're most likely going to get Montgomery back. You've got Jared Goff, who's the best quarterback that the Packers defense has played against all year coming into town. And you're likely not going to have your best cornerback on the field in Alexander. That's a recipe for disaster in my opinion. Just putting it for what it is. So that's the first area of weakness that I think the Lions can take advantage of. Now, here's the other thing. The other area, and I, like I said earlier when I was mentioning about those injuries to the linemen, the Lions' pass-slash-run defense in terms, of the, in terms of the defensive linemen and edge rushers should have the ability to get some potential production in this game. Because let's think about this. Last week, against the Falcons, the Lions held a top-five rushing attack in B. John Robinson and Tyler Algier to under 50 yards of rushing together. And they sacked Desmond Ritter seven times. Now, knowing that, let's consider what the Lions are going to be going up against most likely in Thursday night's game. Chances are, the Lions are not going to have to deal with the starting right tackle, and they're not going to have to deal with the starting left tackle. But, to add further insult to injury, they might not have to deal with the starting left guard either. 
So now you're looking at an offensive line that's going to have two out of five starters and three backups operating it. Yeah, I'm thinking if you take a look at it from that perspective, I'm not saying it's guaranteed because a lot of Lions fans thought the exact same thing against the Seattle Seahawks, but I'm going to say this. It's highly more probable that the Lions are going to get more tackles for losses. They're going to get more sacks than what we thought we were going to be getting at this point because of the injuries that the Packers offensive line is dealing with right now. So again, a lot of good opportunity for the edge rushers to get more sacks, more tackles for loss. Same thing for the linebackers. You get the drift here. So that's another area that I think the Lions can get some advantages on the Packers. Now, to be fair, again, I'm not trying to sound like a homer here, but I know Packers fans are likely going to see some of this, and they're going to want to highlight the fact that, one, Jordan Lowe has been playing pretty well to start the first three games of the year, which I'll address that. And on top of that, they're going to also want to address the fact that the Lions are have only won at Lambeau four times out of the last ten contents contests. The Lions have only got four wins, meaning the Packers have won six times out of the last 10 contests when the Lions have come to Lambeau. So they're going to want to highlight that. I already know they're going to highlight it. But let's talk about Jordan Love here since I already have talked about the, the Lambeau record. If you take a look at Jordan Love, he has been somewhat impressive, to, an impressive surprise, so to speak, over the last three games. His stats are not the greatest, but they're pretty damn good. I'll give him his credit. He's got 51 completions for 96 attempts, which is for 53.1 completion percentage, 655 yards, seven touchdowns, one pick to 69.2 QBR rating with a 94.7 passer rating. I'm going to say this right now. Passing touchdowns, excellent. Interceptions, excellent. QBR, excellent. The, the the pass rating, it's good. It's not great, but it's good. But the areas that are massive that are a massive concern for me is the passing completion percentage and the yards. If you think about it, his pass completion percentage is one spot higher than the bottom. And you want to know who the worst quarterback in the NFL is right now in terms of completion percentage? It's Zach Wilson. He is one spot higher than Zach Wilson. That's not an area you want to be in. And again, you take a look at his at his passing yards, that's ranked 18th. That's below average. Again, considering the fact that the Packers have been missing the services of Aaron Jones for the last couple of weeks, you would have thought that they would have used the passing game more to make up his loss, but apparently they have not. So again, the problem I have with Jordan Love is, okay, while he's doing a good job not turning the ball over, he is getting touchdowns and his QBR looks pretty good. The passing completions, as far as completion percentage and the yards, that's a little bit of a concern for me because here's the reason why. Because I took a look at who the Packers have played the last three weeks. They played the Saints, who the Saints have a really good defense, so I can't fault that. The Falcons have a really good defense because we just got done playing them and they have pretty good statistical rankings. But here's the funny part about this. If you take a look at the other opponent the, the Packers have played, they've played the Bears. I took a look at the passing rankings, the passing statistics for all three of those defenses. The Saints are ranked 8th in passing yards, 5th in passing average, and they're tied for 5th in terms of passing first downs. The Falcons are ranked 4th in passing yards, they're tied ninth in passing average per pass, and they're tied 7th in passing first downs. You then take a look at the Bears. They're dead last almost in terms of passing yards. They're ranked 30th. They're ranked 31st in passing average per throw, and they're tied 21st in terms of their passing first downs. Here's why I'm bringing this up. If you go back to that game against the Bears, who obviously have one of the worst passing defenses in the league, and it's like, listen, stats or not, if you've watched the, pa if you've watched the Bears play over the last couple of weeks, their defense is atrocious. Go back to that game against the Bears. Jordan Love only completed 56% of his passes. To put that in perspective, you want to know who else the Bears have played against this year? They played against the Bucks and the pa and and the Chiefs. Take take a wild guess how much completion percentage that patch that, that that Patrick Mahomes and Baker Mayfield had. Patrick Mahomes 72%. That's expected. But here's what's not expected. Baker Mayfield has the best completion percentage out of all quarterbacks that have played the Bears so far. He completed 76% of his passes against the Bears. So wait a minute here. Baker Mayfield was better in terms of completing passes against the Bears by the tune of 20 more percent? That's a little bit concerning to me. If you can't take advantage of the Bears when they have one of the worst defenses in the NFL 
Um, what the Thunder makes you think you're going to do against the Lions? That's just me asking a very straightforward question. So my whole point is this. Are the Lions dealing with injuries? Yes, they are. But the Lions have proven time and time again that when they have injuries, they have an ability to overcome. And I'm not at all worried about the Lions' injuries. Even if all of those guys that I talked about don't somehow make it onto the field on Thursday night, I still think we can come out with a win. I'm not saying we will. I think we can. But when you talk about the Packers, this is still a very young team in terms of the leadership component because, hey, you've got Jordan Love as the starter for the first time, like a full-time starter. The Packers are rebuilding. They might want to call it a retool. It's not a retool. You're rebuilding. And then you have to think about this. You've got all those injuries that I brought up, whether it's Bakhtiari, whether it's whether it's Tom, whether it's, whether it's the left guard, whether it's Jair Alexander. It doesn't matter. They are literally dealing with a whole bunch of injuries. And here's the biggest part about this that is also something in regards to the whole thing with Jordan Love. I took a look at this one too. This is Jordan Love's very first primetime game that he's getting set to play. And all the other times that he's played with the Packers, he's never once started a primetime game. So not only, as I said earlier in the beginning of the episode, this is a division, a division rival game, it's a primetime game and it's to determine who gets the lead in the NFC North. That's a pretty damn big game. That's an important game. Something that Jordan Love does not have a lot of experience playing in. Jared Goff, on the other hand, has actually played in the Super Bowl. So you do the math on trying to figure out the comparative analysis there, my friends. That's my whole point. The injuries for the Packers plus the inexperience of Love is what I'm getting at with this episode. So I know what I said. Injuries should never be used as an excuse but I find it hard to believe that with all the injuries that the Packers have, that they're going to be able to stand up even if the Lions don't have any of the guys I just mentioned come step out on the field as well. So again, are the Lions likely going to lose this game due to injuries? I don't think so. But again, it's definitely something to at least keep in the back of one's mind. So at least something to think about, something to chew on. But with that having been said, folks, I figured I've done a pretty good job of presenting the, el the evidence, pretty good job of presenting the analysis. So you guys tell me what you guys think. And with that having been said, I just want to say thank you all for watching yet another episode of MCM, Motor City Mania. If you like what you saw, by all means, I highly encourage you all to do one of these three things, or all three of them. It's even better. Like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. If by chance you subscribed in the past and you forgot to do so at the time, or you've just subscribed and you've not yet had a chance to do so, please make sure you turn on that bell notification icon at the bottom of the page so that way you never miss any more content that I push out. Again, we just started this channel about a week and a half ago. It's already made steady gains, but let's keep going. Let's keep getting more subscribers. Let's keep sharing the content. Speaking of which, I highly encourage you all to share this content with your Lions friends and family members. Share it here on YouTube. Share it on Twitter. Share it on Facebook. Let's keep getting more people to come back from my old channel into this one. Let's keep up the good work, folks. And with that having been said, I just want to say once again, thank you all for tuning into the show. Thank you all for your views, support, patronage. Thank you for everything you all do. And with that, I just want to say God bless. And until the next time we meet, I'll see you all in the next episode.